You're living and dreaming what these kids nowadays play on Call of Duty. That was your, your day job, day in, day out. The big difference from that is, is the smells, it's the sounds that you don't get through the screen. So I used to drop the, uh, the bombs from the jets. And you know, when them 500 pounders start hitting and the ground starts shaking, you know, that's what you can't feel through the TV screen. What does it feel like? when you have to like look a man in the eye and maybe you're, you're about to take their life. Yeah. What is that moment like? You don't really have time to think. Um, you get put into situations where if you pause, you know, it's you or them really. Um, you know, you, it's not that we are, that we, we, we have no empathy or, or feeling at all. You know, most of the people, if not 100% of the people we're going against are not good people. Uh, and they've killed and murdered and, and raped people before. And so really when we're going in there, we, we don't have a, a sense of empathy for them. We have a mission uh, and the mission is either to kill or destroy or to capture those people. No, for me, when we're, when we're training, we rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Uh, and then once we, we know we've got it, we keep going again. You know, it's all about the, the training because then on the day of the race, you don't want to hesitate. You don't want to pause because you want to have that upper edge if you lose that upper edge then they've got that on you I and mean, then not only is your life at risk but the, your guys on the team so for me it was always about not letting the team down and always achieving the mission so it sounds very like dark to say that i don't feel because everyone does feel um but for us we before we go in there we know the history of these people we know how bad they are and so that sort of dilutes that sort of feeling that you potentially did have yeah I had to serve in the army for a brief time in Cuba. So yeah. I was born and raised in Cuba. And, you know, every man has to go to the conscripts. Mil yeah. Yes. So we had uh, some of the drills where they were coming into the barracks, shooting AK-47s. Like you had to get up, like get your yeah. gear, go run, like do this and that. Yeah. We had our weapons. We had to go out to the, to the field. And like that was, it, it was a lot of fun, to yeah, be honest. Of course. But also like, it was very shocking, like your body and your mind, everything you're put into a, a, a crazy, stressful situation yeah. where your brain almost doesn't work. Yeah. Now, I never had to go into an actual war or anything like that. How is that in your case, like you have served in Yemen, like you have been out there, you have yeah. done so many things. What is it like when you're actually in a war zone yeah. and you're actually drop in a place where you are going to have to see and do crazy things. What is going through your head? Yeah, I think I think it, the confidence comes with the competency. It's all about the, the training. So something you touched on there at the beginning, like, you know, it was very much a culture shock for you when you first joined. It was like, you know, the guys coming in. The hardest part in the military is that transition from civilian into the military. That's the most difficult part. That was still the most difficult part of my training. But as I did other courses, which were more difficult, I was now not institutionalized. I was doctrinated. I was used to it. So it is that initial period where it just seems overwhelming. But as you then go on in your military career, do other courses, you become more confident in your abilities, uh, your event, which then brings competency as well. So when it comes to going on operational tours, it literally... You, some guys have probably been training for years and years, and this is their first opportunity. So some of them, are, we call it chewing it a bit, they're ready to go. Um, what we then started to get in lights of Afghanistan when, and Iraq, when guys were going tour after tour after tour, that's when guys then started to, um, you know, started to feel the, the, um, uh, the work overload. But, you know, you're doing what you signed up to do. Um, you know, then when you get to the top of your game in the special forces, you're at the pinnacle of your, your career, your, as I used to say, you're living and dreaming what these kids nowadays play on Call of Duty. That was your, your day job, day in, day out. Um, but yes, the initial time that you joined the military from civilian street, that's always um, a culture shock. And that's where they, they test them. That's what they're looking to do. They're looking to, it's that shock and awe, but then quickly change you into that sort of military mindset. And then from then on, each course that you go on will be slightly more difficult. But, you know, they, they, it's like you can't go straight from a civilian straight to tier one special forces. You know, that would just blow their mind. You have to slowly grudge them up for various courses to do that. Um, and so yeah, there is a process within the military. My tattoo documentary, Literary Inc., is streaming now on all platforms. 
If you love stories, documentaries, and especially if you love tattoos and Harry Potter, this movie is just for you. Check out Literary Inc. streaming now on all major platforms. Now, what is the, the process like in your case in the UK mm. to join the special forces? How did that happen for you? Yeah, so it, people may not realize, but the special forces is actually tiered. There's tier three, there's tier two, and there's, there's tier one. So here in the in the US, the US Marine Corps are tier three uh, special forces. Your tier two is your Navy SEALs, your Green Berets, your Rangers, and actually your tier one is Delta Force and SEAL Team Six. And so... For us in the UK, we have tier two uh, and two one, tier one. So when I joined the military, um, I had, had no aspirations of joining the military. My father was in the military, mm -hmm. my grandparents military. So when I decided that I was going to do so, you know, my father told me I'd last two minutes. Uh, I wasn't the, <laughs> I wasn't the, the the size that I am now uh, and the type of man I am. Now. I was I was about five foot seven and uh, about one hundred and forty pounds. And so yeah, I had that shock <laughs> when I when I went in. But in a short period of time, you know, within four years, I, I was now um, a commando trained, para trained diver, a, a PTI, which is a gym instructor. So I was already, I was now tier two special forces. Um, I spent eight years in the, uh, the commando tier two special forces, then went reconnaissance, you know, went on tours. And then really you you start channeling your career that the only real option left for you is tier one special forces. So for us in the UK, you can't go straight from civilian to there. And, you know, you have to serve a minimum amount of time or have done a minimum amount of uh, a tours because what they're looking for is maturity in, in the soldiers. Um, unlike tier two special forces, especially on their sort of training, um, you get screamed and shouted at a lot, a bit like the SEALs, they get screamed and shouted at a lot, a lot and they're trying to motivate you through that. Tier one is a totally different beast. They don't even shout at you, you know, because you have to be self-motivated. So it tends to be the average age for our special forces guys to come in is about 28. Yeah, it's 28 years old. So you're looking for that mature guy, guy who, who can be self-motivated uh, because when you're in, the battlefield or when you're doing an escape and evasion for real, you don't have an instructor there shouting at you. You have to be sort of self-motivated. So again, it's the process through the military. By now you would have done a number of courses and you would have, you know, understood what's expected of you. So yeah, but it's a, it's a hard course, you know, six months long. We have 200 starts and eight pass. Eight pass. Eight, eight pass on my one, yeah. Uh, but Jesus. there's enough room to take everyone, but they will not drop the standards. You know, it's about a 95% uh, attrition rate. Wow. And we have two courses a year. So, you know, you really probably maximum maybe getting 20 guys a year through. But when you have Iraq, Afghanistan, guys getting killed, guys getting injured. Um, yeah, it's very easy to maybe lower the standards to get more guys through. But then you're, you're compromising uh, quality and you're compromising uh, the product. What are some of the drills and things that you guys train on that, that you think of that are some of the more important ones? So the more, more important ones for tier one compared to tier two is the hostage rescue. It's the, the black ops stuff. It's, um, you know, whether you're, you're going onto an oil rig or a cruise ship or a hotel or a, an aircraft, it's that hostage rescue stuff. And that, the, the big difference there is, is situation awareness. When you're on a battlefield, you can probably see you know, your enemy is probably a few hundred meters away and you can see the rest of the team around you. When you're doing hostage rescue, you're going into a blacked out building, you're in tight, confined spaces. And so your weapon handling, your safety needs to be uh, paramount and you need to know exactly where everyone else is on the team. So that's the that's the real big jump from tier two to tier one is the hostage rescue. Did you ever had to do an operation where you actually had to go in and do any hostage? Yeah, we would, we were doing hostage situations as well. You know, when I was in, it was the height of uh, the war on terror. Uh, you know, it was the busiest time in UK and US uh, special forces history. So there was Iraq, there was Afghanistan, you know, Somalian pirates were at their peak at this point. Yeah. So there was a number of occasions that the, the guys were called upon to do HR. Yeah. Any, any crazy things that you can tell us? <laughs> you know, I'm governed by the Official Secrecy Act, but, um, you know, a lot of people tell me, you know, when they say, oh, is it a bit like the movies or is it a bit like the computer games? You know, there is an element of truth uh, to that. You know, the, the big difference from that is 
is is is the smells it's the sounds that you don't get through the screen you know yeah. when you when you're on powder the, like the, it's yeah. so fucking strong yeah the powder you know the the the, the grenades the dust from the, yeah, the blast the, the you ringing. know yeah one of my roles within the team i was the um forward air controller the jtac so i used to drop the uh, the bombs from the jets and you know when them 500 pounders start hitting and the ground start shaking you know that's what you can't feel through the tv screen um but it is it gives you that sense of adrenaline uh, we used to get ourselves into a mindset when we we're going out on the ground majority of our stuff was done at night you know taliban used to call us green eyes because that's all they could see was the the green um on, on, our, on our cheekbones but um you know you go out get yourself into the right mindset and some of these guys you, you've been after for a while you know some of them maybe it's the first time they popped up and so we, we would go out after them, you know, and you'd have probably your, your iPod on, you know, uh, listening to like ACDC. But then you then need to come down when we got back in the helicopter, probably listen to Enya or, or, or something like that. And so you go from a real high buzz, but then you, you need to come back down. Um, you, you can't live, you can't live constantly without adrenaline. Yeah. Um, you know, and a lot of guys, they, they can do it. They can switch it on and switch it off. Some guys a bit struggle a bit more. They may have to go to the gym when they get back and vent off more, but everyone has their own sort of coping mechanisms with it. Yeah. Yeah. Now with films, uh, you know, I'm a filmmaker. I love action movies and <laughs> war movies. Yeah. It, it's weird. Cause I, I was kind of happy when I went to the military. The yeah. only bad part is that I didn't, I didn't want to be there because they were doing everything like in a shitty way. Cause it was in Cuba and like people didn't want to be there. Mm. So I always kind of had that desire to be in a military where people yeah. actually wanted to be part of that. And it was in big part because of the movies mm. like block hog, block hog down. Yeah. Yeah. Saving private Ryan. Yeah. So what's your favorite war movie? Ooh, strange enough. I don't really watch much. I'd never used to watch much TV when I was in the military. People bought me Saving Private Ryan and Band the Brothers and I never, never watched them. Um, but you know, Hollywood. So you have never seen Band of Brothers. I've never seen Band of Brothers. I've never seen Saving Private Ryan. No uh, way, yeah. Dean. No, yeah, I know. So yeah, it's bad. <laughs> I know it's bad. So when I was in the military, some guys used to be doing these quotes from these movies I was like you know it sounded like Arnold Schwarzenegger but I, I think for me you know Hollywood's great Hollywood's a great recruitment tool for the military but there's a fine line between Hollywood uh, between authenticity and entertainment you know mm -hmm. I sometimes watch uh, some of these movies I do watch them now I watch these movies with my wife and I was like that'll never happen you know that you know you start critiquing it and breaking it down but yeah. um, I understand there is there's a fine line but you know Black Hawk Down was a great movie um, more in the fact that you know, especially like American uh, military movies, it's all, you know, they glorify it and, and it's very exaggerated. Whereas that was actually quite truthful. You know, they, they sort of really admitted their sort of um, mistakes on that. So that, mm -hmm. that, that, was, that was a good one. Um, you know, a good friend of mine, some of the SEAL guys, I asked them the same sort of question. So why did you join the SEALs? And like, yeah, Navy SEALs with Charlie Sheen. I mean, one of them was like G.I. Jane. I was like, oh, okay, that's another, another good one. Um, yeah. But I, I do like, um, one I do like actually was Tears of the Sun. Tears of, Tears the, of the Sun, sun with Bruce think. Willis, where a SEAL team basically have a mission to go into um, to Africa to rescue some, um, some uh, citizens. But then when they realize actually that they're going to leave a whole um a lot of locals behind who are going to get slaughtered it, the empathy starts coming in and then they then change their mission on the ground and then try to get them out yes bruce willis very famous uh, very famous movie yeah I, I like that one as well because that is very much probably true to the special forces everyone has this perception um because of Hollywood, you know, that we're door kicking and we, we, we're blowing things up, you know, but that's 25% of what we do in the special forces is that offensive action, which is what you see on the TV. But that is always our last resort. That is never our first um, uh, primary role. Our, our main role, 50% of what we do is support and influence its hearts and minds. It's being embedded with the locals, understanding the demographics, the politics, the tribal influences, which doesn't actually sound that sexy and it's not that sexy on TV. Um, and that's what I like about Tears of the Sun. It's actually, there still is the offensive action, um, but it's more the empathy, you know, and, and changing the plan on the ground as well. So how are you guys are doing that in a country that is so different with different language and all that? 
do you guys go out into the city and like meet with people? How are you able to learn all of that? You tend to work with it, with their local forces, their local militaries, uh, whether they're intelligence services. Um, you know, sometimes you will dress up as locals as well. Um, it may be you you have intelligence teams on the ground working with those or working independently, or you're there coaching or mentoring. You're training those locals because we can't be there all the time. As we've seen with Afghanistan, all the Afghan police and military. You know, we're trained. Um, fortunately, they they fell quite quick. But um, but yeah, it's just understanding the ground truth and not what you're seeing on TV. You know, there's a, there's a whole thing at the moment, especially on geopolitical uh, analysis. You know, we have this perception of these countries being quite bad because what TV shows us. But when you're on the ground yourself, it's actually it's not as bad as everyone is making it. It might be a little bit of propaganda. Mm-hmm. Um, a bit like the Muslim community, you know, tarnished with a a brush because of a certain very small amount of individuals who did a bad thing. Actually, the Muslim community is probably one of the most hospitable, friendly communities I've, I've been amongst. Uh, and so that's where we get the guys embedded in that because they're telling the ground truth what's happening on the ground and they're explaining you know, the tribal influences as well. You know, For example, I did a lot of work in Libya and Libya has something like 1,600 tribes. It, you know, it, it was go back so historically. So it's not as easy to say, well, you guys will run the East, you guys will run the West. You have so many other things and factions to think about. So what are some things that, in your opinion, the governments are not thinking about or just absolutely doing wrong? Because some way, somehow, we end up having wars. And it feels like every few years, another mm. conflict has to happen. Yeah. Why? I, well, I, I, have a, I have a theory on that. Where, you know, it tends to be where there's, where there's oil, uh, there, there, there's trouble. But, you know, I, I have a theory that I, I, I see it now with some of the, the units um, that their recruitment, because Afghanistan has been done now for a few years there's guys in the military now have been in 10 years sergeants staff sergeants who have never been on operational tour which is fine because it's that sort of period but if you then have another 10 years you've got guys that have done a full 22 years who've never had operational tours so you're losing that experience the majority of the guys when i was in you know did afghan iraq or now um c- civilians so what you then have is you have an issue with um a with skill fade within the within the military you don't have the guys with the operational experience you then also have recruitment issues guys if there's no nothing exciting to do then guys and girls won't join so there's a recruitment issue but there's also um defense contracts which keep needing renewing so my theory is that every 10 years you need a war to reboost the uh, recruitment, to keep the the the, uh, the militaries, their skill sets up, and also to renew these defense contracts. Uh, and also ammunition has a shelf life. You know, it, it will expire at certain points. So you can utilize that rather than wasting the money. So for back in the UK, we had the Falklands War in 1982. You had the Gulf War in ni- uh, 1991. You had September 11th, 2001 for 20 years. And here we are in 2023. And there's you got Ukraine kicking off, and then mm-hmm. there's uh, issues potentially on the Pacific. So, it, it, that is my theory. But you know, it does. It keeps it keeps the skill sets within the military, keeps the recruitment up, and people start renewing contracts, buying new aircraft, tanks. I, I feel like our capitalistic system, mm-hmm. some way somehow, keeps pumping out like all of this ammunition, tanks, yeah. technology, all of that, and we need it. Yeah. But then you have a huge amount of people that don't want any of that to happen. Yeah. And part of it, I understand, like I want peace. I don't want anything wrong to happen and I don't want people to die. Mm. But whenever people want to push the other side and be like, we should have no weapons, no guns, no war at all. No, like the US should not be involved in any of these conflicts or all of these countries should stay out of that. What do you think about that? Well, I I agree. I, you know, if I had it my way, I don't think we should have wars. You know, I'm I'm not pro-war at all, but, I do feel that it's better to have and not need than need and not have. You know, it, if we then take away all our capabilities and functions, and that, but then the bad guys have it, then how are we going to be able to compete with that? So, you know, there's an element of maybe scaremongering uh, as well, which, which then people then justify, yes, we need more ammunition, we need more guns and things like that. But there has to be a balance. You need to be able to protect yourself, um, but there's protecting yourself if attacked but not be the attacker 
do you believe that people like regular civilians and citizens mm. should they have weapons like should yeah. they know how to handle weapons like yeah and, I, <laughs> and why yeah so i, I uh, interesting enough i get i get sponsored by uh, weapon brands and, and scope brands here in the us and but i come from a culture in the uk where we don't have weapons you know you can't buy weapons on on, on the street you know the only time i touched the weapon was when i was in the military But here, I, I understand the, the Second Amendment, and I, feel, I do believe that you should be able to protect yourself, but I don't believe that you should be able to buy an AR-15. You know, I think California is one of the most strictest, strictest states, and you can only buy one weapon every 30 days. I'm like, well, how many weapons do you need? That's still a lot. Yeah, that is still a lot. But I know it's actually all about education and training. I know I'm, I can do more damage with a pistol than someone with an AR-15 who doesn't know how to use an AR-15. And so I think with the right training, the pistol is, is just as effective than, than these, these, uh, these bigger So weapons. you think that rifles should be banned or not, not Rifles should accessible. be used for hunting. You know, use that for, for hunting. But to use an AR-15 to protect yourself and, uh, and your families, you know, you, you're not in Baghdad. You're not in Tripoli. Um, yeah, I but, agree with you on that. Yeah. But, I, you know, I, I'm not saying don't protect yourself. Everyone has the right to protect yourself, and I, and I get it. You know, and, and for me, now we come to America, I, I will have a gun, and I, I will have a gun because I, only, I want to be in a position that I can help if I come across a situation like that. I don't see it as, a, as an offensive. It's more of a, de a defensive um, uh, tool for me. But, yeah, it's all about education. You know, you put their hands, you know, my wife's come here as well. She's, she's trained up, and she's very competent with the pistol from when she first got here. And there's a few of our friends, they're kids, and they're, they're like, they have to have a weapon for protection. Um, but when you start educating and teaching, they, they, they realize how to use it accurately. Uh, I came here and there was a, a friend of mine, and he had all these weapons. I was like, okay. And he wasn't military, he was a civilian. And I said, well, have you zeroed them? And he said, what does that mean? So he hadn't even zeroed Just his weapon. Lined yeah, them up. Like, you know, yeah. to his, uh, some like, oh my word. Thankfully, he'd never been into a firefight. So it's all about education. So I'm not saying, no, you shouldn't have weapons. I think there should be a limit on what you should buy. Um, but I also think there needs to be a lot of protocol before you can buy that weapon. Yes, mental health checks, but also there should be training as well. You need to hit certain standards on training, be able to, Uh, assess the, the state of a weapon and make it safe, unload it, reload it, and then also be able to hit a certain target. If you can't hit a barn door from 50 yards, then I don't think you should have a, uh, have a, have a pistol. So, um, yeah, I think there should be just a bit more training involved. Yeah, I agree yeah. with you 100%. Like, yeah. I grew up in Cuba and we had no weapons at all. Mm. Nobody's allowed to no have missiles? a weapon. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, I do believe they have missiles somewhere yeah, yeah. in Cuba. Oh, there's missiles everywhere. Yeah, I, yeah. I do believe that because Castro was like a, he was a evil guy. Yeah, so yeah. I'm pretty sure he had the missiles. Yeah. Now, part of me thinks he was bluffing. So I'm split yeah. 50 50. Mm. Uh, one thing that we were uh, having a conversation with my brother and I the other day that we were super like split about is. Guantanamo Bay. Yeah. How in the world you have Castro, yeah. Russia, yeah. and they are allowed to have the Guantanamo Bay still there. Yeah. How do you think they got away with that? Oh, yeah. I know. That's, that's an American. <laughs> I don't know how they got away with that, to be honest. It's, um, you know, it's a, it's a difficult one. You can't criticize a, a certain individuals the way that they operate, and then you just do bad yourself. You know, you're supposed to be an example to the world. You know, it's a bit like Gaddafi and, and, and Hussein. You know, we took these bad people out and then it's like, actually, we then made it worse. You, you know, I know when like, lights of Gaddafi uh, got killed, those who sort of, you know, who killed him, you know, posted a video which was quite gruesome. And they're like, well, no, you can't do that because this guy you've taken down is a bad person. You can't then to be seen to be bad yourself, you know. So you, you can't you can't replace bad with bad and so yeah i don't mean that was a good decision regards guantanamo yeah i'm i'm really not sure what happened there mm. i think castro just he didn't have the the actual power to go against yeah. the us yeah and I, i think as well you know talks to like to saddam hussein and, and gaddafi you know and when when they went there was a lot more trouble You know, I'm not saying it's, they were good people, but they do say that, that they controlled the beast. You know, what I mean, there, there had to be an element of control. But 
I think it just went too far uh, at one point. Um, but then, you know, then we had the Arab Spring. You know, the Arab Spring actually was the first time I worked in the security industry. I, I got injured out of the Special Forces after 16 years. And within 48 hours, I was in Libya, in Benghazi, uh, help, helping set up the British Embassy uh, in Benghazi. So I saw the Arab Spring from the very early stages to the, the latter stages as well. And uh, so the majority of my time was in, was in those regions. So I saw how difficult it was for the people when the likes of Gaddafi were there. But then I then saw a sudden, you know, there was a slight improvement and then a sudden drop as well. So, and that's when you then, because you then have your 1600 tribes, your different groups fighting and arguing as well. So yeah, I'm not saying it was good having them, um, but I think, you know, for uh, us nations going into help, we need to understand, you know, what's going on underneath as well. You know, it's, it's all well and good taking the, taking their head off the the serpent. Yeah. But yeah, but what's, what's, it, what's the rest of the serpent? Well, tell me a bit about your accident. I know you had a, a parachuting accident yeah. and, and you got hurt. How was that? What happened? Like, I don't know the details of Yeah, like, so story. I was doing, I was going back to Afghanistan on another tour about two weeks before the tour we're in Oman uh, training. And uh, I was doing a, what's called a hey-ho jump. So it's a high altitude, high opening jump. So unlike halo, which is skydiving, um, your, your free lines, you're still attached to the aircraft. You jump out the aircraft and, and, and it's pulled. a static line. So it's at 15,000 feet. It's the limits of oxygen. So any higher, you have to go on oxygen. So you exit the aircraft, the parachute will open. And when you travel up to 50 kilometers or 30 minutes, you fly the parachute to the target area. So I'd done about three or four of these jumps this day. I'd done hundreds of these jumps before, and I'd done them operationally as well. So very competent in the air. <clears throat> but this time when I exited the aircraft, I looked up and my leg <laughs> was caught in a line above my head. And so I'm, I'm frantically trying to kick my leg out before the parachute opens. And I, I couldn't clear it in time and my leg went over my head and to the right. But thankfully, my, my ankle did clear from the line and didn't rip my leg completely off. But straight away, I'd never, you know, I screamed out. I'd never had pain like that. Um, because you're on the, the altitude is so thin out there, I was drifting in and out of consciousness. I was vomiting on myself because of the pain. Mm -hmm. um, but I could see the rest of my team. Um, there's no point in me coming on the radio telling them, I was injured because there was nothing anyone could do. So my first uh, thought process was, how am I going to land this? Because um, I've only got one good leg. So I, uh, I saw the other parachutes approaching and then I, I took a, the best approach, landed uh, one-legged. It was a good landing, but the damage sustained uh, ended my career. I tore my um, ACL, my MCL, my lateral uh, meniscus within my knee or the ligaments, mm -hmm. my hamstring, my calf and my quadricep as well. So all the other supporting muscles. So my friends went off to Afghanistan um, two weeks later and then I was now sort of heading out of the military. But that's all I'd ever known from the age of 17 to now 33. I had no aspirations of being a civilian. Um, I was a, a, what we call a lifer. I was going to stay in as long as I could or till they kicked me out. So... So yeah, that, that was my, my military career uh, ended. Um, thankfully, you know, I was going through a bit of an identity crisis because I got to where I was in the military because of my physical robustness. Mm -hmm. I now couldn't even run 100 meters. But my wife's very entrepreneurial. Um, you know, she, she set up our first security company on a BlackBerry phone uh, in about 20 minutes. And I'm like, you know, for me, it's like where I've ticked the right paperwork because I never had to deal with any of that when I was in the military. The military sort of take those distractions away from you so you can just concentrate on what you need to do so you know, you know I've never had to do a, a proposal or a contract and, and things like that but to add to the pressure Alana was eight months pregnant with our first daughter wow. so not only am I transitioning into this this new work um, like uh, this new alien life to me I also had to w worry about where I could support uh, Alana my, and my newborn so, yeah, within 48 hours, I got a phone call that, you know, can I help set up the British Embassy in Benghazi, uh, which I was doing. But me being m myself, um, I wanted to find a niche within the industry. A lot of my friends were working in Afghanistan and Iraq six weeks on, six weeks off, knowing what they were doing every six weeks. But I wanted to learn more about this industry and I wanted to sort of stand out. I wanted to find an area that I could, you know, really focus on. 
And during that period, Gaddafi was still in Tripoli. Uh, he was now surrounded by the military, but all the oil and gas, NGOs, big security companies, they're all starting to form up now um, behind the front lines, ready for them to fall and sort of take these contracts. And these security companies were charging seven, six, seven figure sums for crisis management, evacuation plans, and selling them to the oil and gas, to the NGOs, when really there was nothing in place. Uh, you know, it was just as good as the paper it was written on. So I flew back from Libya, Lana gave birth to Molly, and I said, look, you, um, I, I have a plan, do you mind if I take some of the money out of our savings? And uh, she said, yeah, of course. <clears throat> and there was a huge proliferation of weapons in Libya at this point. But they, once Gaddafi had fallen, they, they were gonna control the weapons. They didn't want security companies walking around with weapons. And so this was the only period I had. I bought 30 weapons on the black market and I buried them between Tunis and Egypt. Uh, and spent a month in the desert burying them with comms kits with money and I designed uh, the evacuation plans and sold it to the oil and gas sector um, <laughs> but again I'm very lucky to have uh, Alana because other wives will probably be more worried about money make sure there's plenty of money coming in but mm -hmm. each I, I worked ad hoc and so each phone call I was getting was a different country it was a different type of security task you know and, and uh, uh, a different continent and so, you know, when people look at you and you tell them you're in security, they, they think you're the, the concierge of this building or, a, you know, a doorman from the local nightclub. But it, it's surveillance, it's close protection, it's coaching and mentoring, it's geopolitical analysis. There's so many sectors within the security industry. And so I was learning a lot about the security industry in a short period of time. And Alana was planning all the projects for me. Alana actually was trained as a close protection officer, surveillance officer as well. So, but unfortunately, fell pregnant with Molly. So when I was on the ground, Alana was planning those and was the intelligence behind the scenes. And I'd just finished the London Olympics and I was in Benghazi and it was September the, uh, September 11th, uh, 2012. Um, and you probably, if you watch the movies, 13 hours. Have you seen 13 hours? movie is so yeah. freaking good. <clears throat> so I was in Benghazi that night. And I single-handedly evacuated an oil company, a German oil company from Benghazi to Tripoli through safe houses that I had in the desert. And because of the success of that, two years later, I was in Brazil covering the World Cup, and the, 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 the football World Cup, or the soccer World Cup, FIFA yeah. World Cup. And um, I then get another phone call. And there was a Tripoli war now between the militias and the government. And they basically were at war in Tripoli. And it was a Canadian embassy and they said, look, you know, we've heard your name. Um, you've obviously had uh, proven that you can do it before. Can you, can you help us? So I went in and I single-handedly evacuated the Canadian embassy, 18 military and four diplomats um, from uh, Tripoli in, into Tunis. So we soon established that, you know, we then got to the top of the game within the security industry. And in between that, I'd been to other countries, you know, governments, presidents requested your services, whether it's training or, or, or it's advice. But I, um, yeah, I came back from that trip and uh, Alana had sort of highlighted I'd only been home 21 days in a 365 day calendar and something, something had to change. Yeah. How did you guys meet? Oh, Alana and I met it's coming up to our 14th uh, anniversary where we met actually. And I was in the SBS at the time. Alana was a bank manager in Aberdeen. And just for your listeners, geographically, the SBS are based right at the bottom of the UK and Aberdeen's almost right at the top of the UK. It's like, you know, about 650 miles away. And I just come back of a job and my Sergeant Major was like, it was on a Friday afternoon. He's like, Dean, you're flying up to Aberdeen. On, uh, on Sunday, I was like, where's Aberdeen? It was like up in Scotland. So in the SBS, we do uh, combat swimming as divers. And um, the company that does our rebreathing diving kit were based in Aberdeen. So Aberdeen is the oil and gas capital of Europe. It's the Houston of Europe. So they have 400 plus uh, offshore platforms, oil rigs in the North Sea. So all the saturation divers, all the big diving companies that are based up there, hence why I got flown up. And it was a bank holiday uh, Monday. So bank holiday, uh, uh, like few and far between throughout the year, about five or six. And bank holiday Monday means, as it is, it's a bank holiday, but everyone's mm -hmm. off. Which then means that Sunday is now the new Saturday night. You know, everyone's out drinking. And I, I met a couple of guys I was uh, on the flight with me who I knew from my time in the commandos who were, were divers. And they said, look, we're going out tonight. And I was like, look, I've been away, I'm tired. 
I've got no interest. But I ended up, yeah, they, they, they twisted my arm and I ended up going out. And Alana was out, you know, she was a bank manager at the time. She was out of a couple of girls that she worked with. And I, I know it's one of those evenings that you weren't even, you know, you know, you know, I wasn't even looking. I was so tired. I mean, I didn't realize, but the guys that I was with, about 30 offshore divers, they'd all been going over chatting to Alana and her friends and sort of, you know, getting pushed back. And uh, <laughs> one of my friends said, oh, those Norwegians fancy you. And my wife had very blonde hair. And I was like, ah, really? So I took the risk. Yeah, I went over and started chatting to them. And yeah, that's how we, how we first met anyway. Or do you remember what you came and told them with your first line? Um, I know. I, I think uh, you know. I you know. We have a thing called the. Uh, I thought it'd be quite good to impress girls, and you know, telling me in the special forces. You know, yeah. so I was, you know, I told her I was in the SBS, and she didn't know what that. She thought it was a furniture company. So actually, <laughs> she, you know, she didn't come with me. The, the special forces line didn't work with her. Uh, so you know, it must be my charm and my looks. So you train for years and years and years. Yeah. You become the Doesn't baddest matter. motherfucker yeah. on earth. You can kill anyone. Doesn't matter. Yeah, just, and they're not impressed. Yeah, I think I just lift sofas and fridges. You know what I mean? There we go. <laughs> so, that's hilarious yeah but um you know we we soon hit off i was there for the week and alana we went out every evening and 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 you know i i think for me and now we've been together a long time she pushes me and i push her uh, in in the right way we don't think anything's impossible when i when i met her she i asked her you know what is it you always wanted to be because she was a bank manager very very successful and she said i've always wanted to be a spy and i was like well so where, how are you getting on with that then? Have you, you know, have you, you looked into it? And, and Aberdeen is very oil and gas, as we touched on, a, a lot of men and, um, you know, a lot of people have that sort of negative attitude, you know, you can't do that sort of attitude. Mm -hmm. So I think Alana had probably sort of listened to them a bit too, a bit too much. And I said, well, where are you with it? And she goes, well, I haven't done anything with it. Well, my friend was the head of uh training and selection for mi6 which is like the cia and so i rang him yeah. up and i said look do yeah. you, can you send me an application form i have a potential candidate yeah and then the next day dropped it off at the bank and i think that's when she knew that yeah this guy is probably gonna you know push He's me in the right over. direction yeah yeah and that's interesting because i know i remember for one of the interviews that they didn't know that it was a she that was going to do the application <laughs> probably yeah and yeah. that's very interesting that you were able to find there's not that many women that want to get into that field, yeah. want to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think I think that might have been the maritime security one, that one, because there, there was a company when I was in the SBS and they were like offering 50% discount to the SBS. And Alana was like seven months pregnant. And so I was like, are you still doing 50% discount? He said, yeah. I said, perfect. And I dropped Alana off the next day. He thought I was coming. I mean, as Alana was pregnant. <laughs> um, but yeah, these guys were doing the ship security officers and Alana was doing company security officer, which means you can manage ship security guys. So these guys were Royal Marines and military, but actually Alana academically, you know, they would help her with, with some of the stuff around the ship, but actually Alana would then help them with all their exams as well. But yeah, I think the guy's face, he thought I was coming. Um, but I, I took his 50% discount and then just gave it to Alana, yeah. <laughs> I know that you and Alana do a lot of work uh, with nonprofits and yeah. trying to raise uh, money for mental health awareness. Mm. Tell me a little bit about the work that you guys do there. Yeah, so when I came out of the military, you know, I wanted to give back to the veteran community. Um, you know, I really identified when I got out, the transition was quite difficult, you know. It, well, mine was quite smooth, actually, because of Alana, but others can be quite turbulent. Mm -hmm. And so I just always wanted to give back to my... Because I, I don't know why, I, I felt guilty leaving the military early and sort of leaving my friends in there. You know, a couple of friends got killed and, you know, you sort of question yourself, you know, well, if I was on that tour and things like that. So wherever I could, I, I would try and give back to the veteran community. But when I came back from the... Um, Canadian, the Canadian embassy task, Alana sort of highlighted I'd only been home 21 days in a 365 day calendar. And she said, something needs to change. So chapter 16 in my book is called Dead or Divorce. That was the conversation we were having. Alana was like, if you continue like this, you will either be dead or you will be divorced. And so I hadn't really come to the terms of the fact that I'd left the military or the special forces, about five years actually having left. But I was still trying to match that adrenaline rush, look for that that uh, rush uh, without coming to terms of the fact that I didn't have that support around me. If something went wrong, then you know, the guys weren't going to be parachuting out of the sky and rescue me. So we soon realized and then sort of decided Alana was now a property developer, very successful property developer. And it was like, 
you don't actually need to be working, you know, come work with me. So it took a sabbatical from the secure industry and my injured leg now was two kilos lighter than my good leg because of the muscle wasted because I'd neglected my sort of physical and mental well-being because I was so fixated on working. And so I just bought a, a push bike off Amazon and Alana's office was about eight miles from the house, just cycled to and from the office every day. But straight away, being physically active or, you know, get my lungs going, I felt there was a, a huge weight off my shoulders. But with my backstory, you've heard some of my stories as well. You can imagine me sat in these meetings with Alana and I'm like, you know, just A, I didn't even understand what they were talking about. I mean, there was the glaze over my eyes. And so Alana could see that. And she said, look, you need to do something, you know, to keep yourself physically and mentally engaged, but not smuggle people across borders. <laughs> and so I said, I always remembered as a young boy reading the Guinness Book of Records. And I said, well, I've always fancied doing a world record. And it was about a month before my 40th birthday. So I was having a midlife crisis, wondering about whether I was going to leave a legacy. And Alana said, well, what in? And I said, well, cycling seems to be good because it's not hurting my knee. Mm -hmm. And so... I was looking at all these little cycling routes and then Alana then found the world's longest road, which runs from southern Argentina to northern Alaska. It's 14,000 miles over two continents. And so I said, oh, perfect. And so I, I'd only cycled 20 miles before we applied for the world record. Crazy. And uh, yeah, six weeks later, Guinness said, yes, you've been successful on your application. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, we met each other in the military on a training course on a, the forward air controller, the JTAC, yeah. uh, is Prince Harry. So we've been friends 15 years and we'd actually done a lot with him in charity. You know, he'd been a guest uh, of Alana and I at some of the, the veteran events. You know, I'd done some, I had an intelligence fusion cell based in Mozambique in Tanzania, which used to identify the smuggling routes of the ivory. And so, you know, I used to push that information to him because he was doing a lot with uh, the wildlife on the continent. But this is the first time we'd come out in public together. And so I rang him up and I said, look, I'm going to cycle the world's longest road. Uh, what should we do it for? And him and his brother and Kate were just about to launch a mental health campaign called Heads Together. And it wasn't just veterans. It was everything from postnatal depression, young children, teenagers, you know, the full spectrum. And so uh, we set a target of a million pounds for the Heads Together campaign. Alana was running the campaign, was doing all the fundraising. I mean, I trained for a full year. Um, yeah, the world record was 117 days. And yeah. then I set off a year later. I smashed the world record by 17 days, did it in 99 days and became the, the first man in history to do it under 100 days at the age of 41. Um, so it really it was so I could concentrate on something or get my, my teeth into um, um, but then probably more successful was Alana raised $1.3 million uh, for the for the mental health campaign along the way. So, and that's when your profile started then people started knowing who, who you were. Up until then, we'd be, we kept a very low profile, especially with the work that we're doing in the security industry. That's impressive, Dean. That's, <laughs> that's a story for a movie, man. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think a lot of people say it's like, you've got about three movies in here, you know. It's, but for, for me, it was... Um, you know, I never looked beyond that. I didn't see um, a career in guest speaking or books or, or other TV. You know, I did it so I wasn't smuggling people across borders. So we weren't really ready. And two days after we got back, we were at Harry and Meghan's wedding as well. So, you know, we didn't even get time to appreciate what we'd done. And then we had another high. And, um, you know, one of the things was bit frustrating for me was the fact that you know we'd just done a, a huge thing and an amazing thing we got back to UK I mean obviously it was this great uh, event but all the TV interviews and radio was uh, you know what canapes did you eat you know what, did, what drinks did you have and that really I've just smashed <laughs> two world records and raised over a million uh, dollars but you know everyone was just fixated on that that sort of relationship but uh, but for us it was it was great you know we, we'd done that and um and we always, whatever we do, even now, still in the security stuff, we, everything has a philanthropic or a give back um, angle to it. That's amazing. Mm. So as you were explaining all of this, like one question popped into my head and I would love to see what you think that young men need to do so they can get on a path and mm. get on track to be someone like you. Because yeah. 
I think we need to have new role models that are not just like this fancy rapper yeah. or this like amazing actor. Yeah. And I think people need to see this within their reach. You know, going back even further, but I know my father was in the military. Um, my, my parents split up at a young age. I was eight years old and my mother grabbed me and my sisters and took us to Moss Side in Manchester. Moss Side in Manchester in the 80s was the most dangerous place in the whole of the UK. You know, me and my sisters were the only white kids in school and we were in a homeless home there. And so I go back now and talk with Manchester United Foundation because the kids there are from where, where I was. And so for me, I, yeah, you see these rappers and see all these other successful people and some of them, you know, haven't had humble beginnings. So I think you need a, 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 a person who, who's had humble beginnings, but just realize that you, you come to T-junctions in life just because your friends are going one way. It doesn't mean that that's the direction you need to go. Um, but I, th I think a lot is, is all about belief. It's surrounding yourself with people who are going to push you as well. You know, one of the one of my, my quotes I used to use, especially when I was on the training team on the commando course with the guys, you know, anticipation is worse than participation. A lot of people surround themselves with people who are probably too scared to take that leap or do it themselves. And so they'll pull you back. And they're like, yeah, but you're, you're unique. You're not them. You know, a lot of people, when I was doing my bike ride, actually, a lot of people were like, oh, you know, but, you know, this is how such and such trains. And yeah, but I'm not that person. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm Dean Stott. I know my, my own abilities. So it's about surrounding yourself with the right people, with the right drive and the, and the right vision, um, which, which is quite, it's easier said than done when you're on a podcast like this. You know, some of these kids, and especially these boys and fatherless, uh, families and so you know there are clubs out there you know the military for me you know saved me um, you know I, I, I've always an advocate to tell people if they can join the military even if it's just for three years it just gives you that discipline um, you know g find new friends as well and take as much as you can from the military rather than take from you um, mm -hmm. but for me uh, you know it, it, it was the best thing I ever did yeah why do you think men nowadays are not going to be strong? They're not trying to, everything in the media is pushing, like yeah. the guys need to be more emotional and you need to be softer and you need to be careful with your words and you should not offend anyone. Like, how do we get out of that? Um, I mean, technology, I don't mean technology's helped. I don't think the, the world of social media has helped. You know, I think take a, you, you'll never get away from social media and never get away from technology. It's here now and it's, it's, it's not going to go away. But for me, it's like, it's take a break from that. You know, when I was guest speaking for the Royal Marine Commando School back in UK and the commanding officer and I sat down and he said, how do we train resilience with these young guys that are coming in? And I said, well, you don't, resilience comes from experience. You know, you can't be experienced without experiences. So before I even joined the military, you know, I didn't have a mobile phone. I was always out playing um you know and you, and you start building up that that resilience as well and so an element of that's been taken away but you can still work with both so for me is take a break now and then and, and get yourself out there you know do a sport i'm, I'm very uh, proactive on or promoting physical activity i believe that physical activity helps your helps your mental state um but i think in, uh, social media as well doesn't help with people because People always comparing themselves to other people. You know, Instagram and them lot is just a facade. You know, majority of those people on there aren't as happy as they're making out. You know, just live your own life. Don't live a copy of, of other people. Um, but it's, it's, it's easier said than done. I come from a, I'm 46 years old now. So I come from an era where I knew what it was like before the mobile phone. Um, you know, we, Alana and I have uh, three kids now and they've all, all that, you know, a 12 year old, seven, and 10, 10 months, they, they're born into this world. And so it, it's very difficult for me to say, this is what you need to do because I've come from a, a world that uh, wasn't on the, the social media platform. But um, it's hard. I, I would not want to be a child nowadays. You know, I'm very fortunate. I've lived the life that I have. You know, if I was born now, would I have achieved the same things? Would I be as robust and resilient? I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I speak to, sorry, I speak to guys in the military because I think, oh, you know, the guys are getting weaker. But I said, no, the guys coming through still just as strong. Uh, I just think the world focuses more on the weak, weak, weaker members. There's still a lot of strong, a uh, hell of a lot of strong people out there still. 
Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. I keep meeting more and more guys that are working out, yeah. working on their business. They're trying to push. And and with the social media thing, I in a way, I disagree with you a little bit. Yeah, okay. I feel that instead of telling people to get off of it, yeah. we just need to teach people how to use it productively. Yeah, yeah. Because sense. when you think about it, Dean, it's not going to go away. Yeah, yeah, like we're, we're not going to put our phones away. We're not going to put the, like the iPads and Instagram. It's not going to go away. Yeah, yeah. So you might as well utilize it. Yeah. And there's so much opportunity to give information, to give insight to people to do that. So sure. with, my, with my son, what I do is like, I try to switch the goal. So instead of him thinking, oh, I want to get this game so I can play this, yeah. I try to tell him, well, how many videos have you done this month? Like how many okay. videos have, what video you're working on this week? Yeah, yeah, okay. So that way I can put his attention in producing things uh, okay, and making sense. things yeah. instead of consuming things. Yeah. Because it's so, so wonderful. Like we wouldn't have ever met if it yeah. wasn't because you, you go on podcasts, I have a podcast. So this I feel is bringing people together yeah. and the ability to like talk about things. I, I even believe that this type of conversations can help avoid violence and avoid war. Yeah. Because now we can listen to people from the Islamic community or the yeah. Asian community. We can listen to their conversations and like feel that they're also humans, that they also have dreams, that they also want to do things. and. I think that in our world being more connected mm. is going to help tremendously. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Yeah, I, you know, I think, you know, I, again, I come from, when I was special forces, we weren't on social media. It was a taboo. So actually the first time I was on social media was when we did our bike rides. So yeah, I think you're right. You know, you can, if you use it right, it can be used uh, to your advantage. But yeah, it's, it, it's made the world a smaller place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, But I think, I just think, you know, some of the media outlets are just focusing on the negatives. There's so many mo other positive stories I hear out there. And I think yeah. that's what should be promoted. And I think that's going back to yours. Yeah. You're talking about weaker guys that there's a hell of a lot of stronger guys now. And, um, and, and like I said, even, even access to training when you don't actually have to leave your house because you just follow someone on, on social media. Yeah, no, there are, there are a lot more pros. Yeah, with media, that's something that it, it gets to me because even on the, on the work that we do, so I, mm. I produce for Impact Theory, I have this show, I do documentaries and all that. When you try to put out a good story of like something positive, yeah, you get half or 20% of the clicks. Right. And then when you have a video that the thumbnail is something like, you know, that incites people to ang yeah, people's yeah. anger yeah, yeah. or resentment, yeah. then it blows up. Yeah. And I don't know how to fix it. I think there's something in the human brain that you're always looking for what's wrong, yeah. what's negative, because if everything is fine, you don't pay too much attention mm. to it. And I'm trying to figure out how can we, th that's the way it works. Yeah. You can't change can't that. Change it, no. So how can we some way, somehow influence people so they learn how to appreciate the mm. good? Like I get into arguments with people all the time who say, America is terrible and like the politics here yeah. are horrible and we're so divided and we yeah. we might have a civil war. And I'm like, you are insane. <laughs> you don't know what a civil war feels like. Yeah, yeah. You don't know what t a dictatorship feels mm -hmm. like. You don't know what a terrible government feels like. Yeah. Here in, in the country where you're from in America, we have freedom of speech. We can say whatever we want. And that is s such a huge freedom. Yeah. And we're actually more united than people think. It's just a matter of perception with media. Yeah. If you go out the street, most people are kind. Most people are going to be good to you. And there's not that much evil. So I love the work that you're doing with your book, Relentless, with mm -hmm. the uh, nonprofits and trying to raise money to let people know like the things that are happening. And I think we need more people like you to go out and tell young guys, hey, like you can get stronger, mm -hmm. you can do better but it's going to be difficult. Yeah. Like you have to go through some yeah, shit yeah. to, to come out the other side mm. stronger. But in a way, like this is the best time, the most peaceful time that we have ever lived. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, for me, like my personal story, my dad told me I'd last two minutes in the military, you know, and I, my, I always think the best course of action is action. You know, I use those negative comments as fuel. And, and, and I, so I, I think with, with some of these people today, it's like, okay, just ignore the negative comments. Just, 
ignore that. Just go out, do I, it. I go and argue with them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you go and argue with them. Yeah, you? I go and argue with them. <laughs> I, 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 I don't, you know, like my dad told me the last two minutes, I was like, fine, there's no point in me getting an argument with him. So <clears throat> Monday morning, joined the army. I mean, you know, by the age of 21 was, you know, para commando diver PTI I and mean, the rest was history. I was the first army guy to go to the special boat service and not the special air service. And, you know, again, guys are out, you can't do that. I was out. Okay, well, give me a chance. And six months later, you know, I was there. Uh, I, you know, I, no one really said it. But when we did the spon sponsorship marketing team, did this SWOT analysis, the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities mm -hmm. and threats on the bike ride. You know, the only weakness that came back was my arrogance towards the cycling community. And I was like, well, I'll take that as a, as a, as a, as a, as a bonus. How is that a weakness? Um, no, how it how it could be perceived as a weakness. Why? Uh, well, they, they just thought that you may get negative feedback or negative impact. But actually, that makes no sense. Well, like it was, it, be it was a charity ride. Right? It was a charity ride. Right? But actually, it wasn't. No one ever said that from the cycling community. But where it could look quite arrogant is those that do this for a living and have been doing it for years who do these big adventures that this 40 year old guy who's actually disabled from the military uh, weighing uh, 200 pounds thinks he's going to cycle the world's longest road he's only it was that well yeah. just watch this space you know i knew i had the i knew i had the endurance i knew i had the mental uh, capacity i just had to take what I'd learned before, whether that was in the military, whether that was in the, the private security and just put that on the challenge and just did it in a, in a, in a sport. Yeah. That's amazing. I think we need to stop worrying about whether we're going to offend someone or not yeah. by going after our goals. Exactly. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, as you touched on divisions, you know, the art of debating disappeared, you know, you know, I, I said, I think people should have a break from Instagram. He said, I disagree. That's perfect. You know, normally people would just start arguing. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I don't mean, yeah, don't be scared to offend anyone. Um, you know, anticipation is worse than participation. You know, just do it. And then when you look back, you'll be like, actually, that wasn't that bad. I mean, it's like, what next? Yeah. Um, now, something that some people might disagree with, do you think that we should have uh, obligatory military service for every man in America? It's very difficult. Um, I don't think it will be a bad thing. Um, I, I think... You know, what did the military do for me as a young 17 year old? It installed uh, discipline, uh, timekeeping. Uh, I, you know, I was respectful anyway, but I did learn a lot in that short period of time. You know, I probably learned more, as we touched on earlier, I probably learned, learned more in that very first phase than I did in, in the latter stages. They were just, you know, you, you come in as a square and, and they start carving you up. You know, 70, I'd probably say 60% of that carving was done in that first year and then you're just fine tuning the last 40 percent and so i don't think it is bad at all um it, you know it gives you free square meals a day keeps you fit you you meet new people um and you and you see that you get to see the world um i i don't, I don't think it's a bad thing at all uh, i i hear people are all like yeah you should bring it back in and i was like but i i think i think it's a good thing yeah i agree with you uh, even though i hated part of my time in the military yeah, yeah so for me i went and because at the time i was living with my grandmother mm. i didn't have to do the full three years okay cool shipped out yeah. in the middle of nowhere my brother cj had to do that he yeah. had it terrible oh, wow. mine was a little bit better so i yeah. did my boot camp my training all of that with yeah. the weapons training all that and then i had to work at a military hospital and i was a janitor like okay. cleaning toilets yeah. for two years, but at least I didn't have to like die or like yeah. go fight with other people. And even though that time was really annoying and so many things went wrong, it it did make me more into a man. Yeah. Because I had to be away. I had to be around other guys. Mm -hmm. You have to walk naked into a room yeah. with like another hundred naked dudes yeah. and like just be in your manlyhood and yeah. just like do what you have to do. Exactly. And I think that is going to help a lot of guys because sometimes here in the U.S. I do see kids who are like 27 and and yeah, it feels like play though. You yeah, know, like yeah, yeah. you could <laughs> exactly. you could smack them around and like they wouldn't be able to hold. Yeah, I think the way around it would be. I know the American military do it as well. Is that you know you serve in the military and you get 
your education pay for it. I think there should be incentivizations, you know, to, 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 br to bring them in as well. Because I think if they're going to go in and like, okay, I'm going to get discipline and things like that, I think there should be for, something for them to look, look, look forward to. Um, but no, yeah, I think you're right. I think the art of being able to speak in public has gone. You know, people say to me when I, when I left the military, I didn't have a, a degree or anything like that. And when I was leaving the military, a lot of my friends are like, they see other people in work, in business, CEOs, I, I can't do that. And I was like, no, we actually, we actually have a lot of skill sets from the military we take for granted. Being able to speak in public, you know, in thousands of people, uh, being able to make a decision, uh, being able to uh, react to crisis management. It's stuff that we're used to doing in the military, we take for granted, which they don't, they don't do here. And so they're the other sort of things that you get from the military, other than your discipline, your timing and, and your fitness, is all those other other traits which is dying traits now that i see here you know and again i think it's you know partly maybe for the phone people are shy to talk in public you know mm -hmm. everyone's now dating everything's online you don't need to you, you can literally spend 24 24 7 and not meet anyone but actually have everything that you need to, to survive and so you know that that's my my worry about it were some of the guys around in in your space that you really respect that you have learned from mm. uh and especially like i watched your interview with Jocko willing yeah and like he's someone that i really look up to I, yeah i listen to his book david goggins like i feel like there's a whole wave of mm. guys like you that are coming out in the public yeah and what you guys are doing is amazing yeah I think for, for us, you know, I, you know, I, I, I met Jocko literally probably the first time I met Jocko was when I came over. I didn't know who Jocko was when I was back in the UK. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I got to, to know him and it, I mean, you know, I get told that I'm like the British version of David Goggins. Well, I like to disagree because I don't swear as much as that guy. <laughs> um, but no, I think, you know, there's always been this fascination with people from the military, especially the special forces. I don't know if it's the secrecy thing, but I think where we're sort of, what we're doing is is being able to share what we can with other people. I call it the battlefield to the boardroom, especially what Jocko and them are doing. You know, what do we do in in when we're out on deployment, and how can people learn uh, from this side? But I, again, the birth of Google has enabled some of these special forces guys to come out and and, and share their stories. You know, before we were never able to do that. Um, for me, you know, one of the guys here in the, sh we've been here three years now in America, you know, I've met Jocko and, and those guys, you know, one of the guys I like, who I very fond of, Jack Carr, um, who, who's, mm -hmm. who's an author. He, he, um, very humble Navy SEAL. He, you know, a lot of guys when they got out sort of followed my route, you know, did the, the private security, but he, he decided that he'd always wanted to be an author. Have you seen Terminal List on Amazon Prime? Not yet. Yeah, yeah. well, that's, that's his, you know, no that's way. his, um, from his books, his fiction books. And so he, he um, and Chris Pratt, he said that when he left, I want to write fiction books and I want Chris Pratt one day to play. And, and that's what he did. You know, it's that, it's that vision. Um, but that's what I like about him because he hasn't gone the traditional route that I and some of the other guys mm -hmm. have gone and focus on. Uh, leadership and coaching and, and, and fitness you know he's gone and done something totally different but become the best in uh, what you can do and that's the great thing about the, the special forces you know our ethos in our special forces is the unrelenting pursuit of excellence which I love because it's not just in um, special forces sport it could be in anything it could be in finance it could be in media it can be in writing you know if you're going to do something you do it to the best of your ability you know yeah. you have that same mindset so it's just having that same mindset and just being able to drop that into anything anything that you do so jack carr is is one for me because he's done something and taken a risk something completely different and he has he's got to the top of his game in in something um that he, he's never done before yeah well we need to see if we can find any of your stories and try to turn that into a movie that would be yeah interesting. maybe yeah we should do that yeah we'll probably get jason Statham to play me but he'd be, be a little bit skinnier i think i you know? see yeah. i can see that you can see it can <laughs> he, he he's a he's a tough guy like his movies are amazing though. yeah no he, he's good uh, i do get joked i look like jason Statham. you you do yeah well i don't know yeah. i mean i don't know maybe maybe <laughs> so. i mean i think he wishes he looked like you he needs to get <laughs> no, yeah, like no you. doubt no doubt but i think i think for me i just like while i still am fit you know i'm 46 years old I, I do, i'll always whatever i do i'll you know I, i'm not the type of person like for example to just go buy a bike and go join the cycling club it has to be 
you know, the biggest or hardest challenge. And, and while I, I still am able to do it, I, and that's what I'm trying to promote to young children as well, adults, it's never too late to start a sport or start anything in life, but then be the best at it. You know, I started cycling at 40 and became the world record at 41, you know, never rode a bike before. So I believe that anyone with the right mindset, uh, the right training, the right team around them, uh, team's important. Yeah, it's, it's within your reach. Um, yeah. So, Dean, if you had all the money in the world and all the time in the world, yeah. what would you do? Spend more time with my kids. <laughs> yeah. More time with my kids and my family. Um, I, 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 I've sacrificed a lot, especially with Molly, my, my first daughter. She was born, as I touched on, as I was leaving the, the, the military. And so, and so I didn't get to spend as much, much time with them. But I think, I, you know, I'm one of many fathers who probably say you could spend more time at home. But um, for me, it would be a, it would just spend more time with my, with my children if possible. But I, I think hopefully now they, they will look at me and their mum and see what we're doing and then realise actually, you know, and we're building them a better home as well and, and giving them the right sort of traits in life. More time with family. Yeah, it's an easy one. That's wonderful. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming and checking out this episode. If you like this interview with Dean, check out this other interview right here. I'm sure you're going to like it. We'll see you on the next one.